been looking at uh, you know these uh, what faith is, um, looking at what the what how faith directly impacts our the influence that we can have, and I want to kind of. Uh, use that as we, you know, as we continue the rest of what we're going to be looking at. Um, we're going to kind of turn in kind of a different direction tonight, of sorts, but it still has to do with the same study that we're looking at, and that is the fruit of the spirit. Uh, faith definitely is affected by the fruit of the spirit, or faith can affect the fruit of the spirit. And uh, we find this in Galatians chapter five. Um, which we will eventually be in in just a few minutes here. I want I to kind of get our minds going, though, uh, with because there's two parts. You know, when you look at Galatians chapter 5, there's two parts, really, of what, they're, uh, of what Paul's looking at right here and what he wants to, uh, those in Galatia to know. And that is, you know, the, fruits of the, the fruit of the Spirit and also the works of the flesh. But in verse 16, he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, the lust of the flesh has a lot to do with our influence in a negative way when we look at it. And I want to start this out tonight uh, by asking this question and getting us kind of going. You know, a few weeks ago, we were looking at uh, ways that can, things that can weaken our faith. Tonight, I want to ask the question, Since we've been talking about influence, what can damage our influence? Of course, we looked at you know a lot of things that can build up our influence last week. But what are some things you know, as especially as a Christian, what you know we, we know how important it is to influence other people. But what are some things that can damage our influence? Okay. That can actually cover a couple of different items in there. Do you want to expand of what you're thinking of? Well, there are two things that can affect our influence. One is the things we talk about and the way we talk. Okay. Oh, very good. So just how we interact with one another and how we how courteous or respectful we are to different people. And I mean, that's a, you know, that's a big one. We're trying to influence people who, you know, especially of a different faith, isn't it? Because it, sometimes we can get worked up. We can, and if we disagree, how do we handle that? I mean, do we just lash out? Do we just, you know, do we immediately you know, take them to task? Or is there a different way that we can approach that? And so the speech... Okay. Okay. So just in general. Okay. So how you talk to someone is important as far as our influence. Is concerned because at some point, if you bring, you know, if religion ever does come into it, and like Stacy said, if, you know, if they just know you as being someone who's aggressive or combative in our in, in your tone, that is, uh, you know, that can really affect how they're going to listen to you in other areas as well. I mean, are you, you know, are you likable? Are you approachable? And so that's a big one. What was the other one that you're thinking that you're think, thinking of? The words that we say. Okay. Okay. You know, gossiping, you know, just the different things that we choose to say, the things we choose to say and how we choose to say them. Okay. That's a big one. And there's a, one that's really a hot item now. We're, you know, who knows what a euphemism is? How important is even using euphemism in our speech? And I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Um, you know, when someone says, OMG, we know what that we know what that means, isn't it? We know when they write it. People sometimes say it. 
Uh, and we know what, what it is. Even though they don't directly say it, we know if a person says that, we know, well, they probably are not giving a lot, of, putting a lot of stock into the, in respecting Christ because they are saying, and even though they don't directly say it. There's a big thing right now that's in the uh, news, and you probably are familiar with uh, where it even comes from, and that is uh, there's a phrase that people are using, let's go Brandon right now. And if you do the research on, I mean, everybody's saying it. In fact, I've heard a lot of Christians say it because they think it's funny. And you, th- you know, when you when you do the research of where that even came from, it is it's vile. And why would a Christian ever use something like that? And it's you know, and it's simply a euphemism. And while that term in and of itself is not vulgar per se, you know what people are saying and where it came from. And you think, what you know, why would someone completely soil their speech? And the message that we're trying to put out in reaching people and trying to enlighten people with Christ, and you know, and that's and, and that's what people are going to remember. That's how they're going to know us, and that's how they're going to define us. Isn't like that? Oh, isn't he though? I mean, he you know he's uses every trick in the book, and yeah, euphemisms are a huge thing. We don't have to even directly say these words or phrases with that you know, but we. Society uses them. They know what they are. They know what they mean. And when they hear a Christian say them, and all it takes is one time, doesn't it? I mean, we can be as respectful and upright, and people can know us and and know we are, you know, we go to worship services, and all it takes is that one time that we say something that is completely uncharacteristic, maybe, of who we are, and it can it, it can really throw us for a curve and especially in influencing people. So speech is a really big one. I'm glad you said that. Any others? I was going to say, it's easier to mess up in front of Christians because they can still forgive them. But when you mess up in front of non-Christians, they don't get it. They don't understand. They They do remember. Right. I mean, does it does it make it better when we mess up in front of our Christian family? Well, I'm just saying it's easier to it's easier to recover from it. No, it's not better. It's not good. But we're human. We I'll, make I'll tell you why I asked that. It's because you know how many of us have said something off the wall, and we may not. You know, you don't realize until you say it sometimes, and you just think, "Good night." I wish I had a filter that could you know stop stuff like this from coming out. Before I say it, you know, so I can think about what I say. But nonetheless, we do sometimes say it and loosely, and uh, you know, and then we say something like, "Oh, you know what I mean, <laughs> right?" Well, I, you know, I didn't mean that. I was, I was just kidding, or I'm just, you know, just, uh, and you know, we try to cover it up. And while, yeah, we know what, uh, you know, we. we we are probably more forgiving, you know, of, of saying, even though we might be like, wow, what, what did you just say? But you have someone who's not, out, you know, who's outside of Christ or a young Christian, and they have no idea. And you think, what, you know, how does that set the, how does that set everything up for how they're going to look at us or listen to us or be influenced? What kind of an example, you know, does that set? And so it is, it's, you know, it's interesting because we are always on, we're constantly on display to people here, to people others. And, you know, like Stacy said, they're probably, they probably are more forgiving here. You know, we can say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Or, I did, you know, I, I was out of line or whatever. And people are like, I know. And, you know, thank you for saying that or whatever. But what happens when you don't have someone like that? What happens when they aren't so forgiving or when they are looking at you and all of a sudden Nathan said this? Or, you know, Stacy or Greg or, you know, or Ken or Kevin, you know, brought up this. And so we can't, you know, now we have to work that much harder to, even, you know, to try to win the trust back or win the respect back with it. What else? What is it? Okay, so the uh, 
Let's see, we can use, oh. Okay, so the company that we keep. How is that, how can that damage our influence? Okay, so people are looking at your, you know, who you're hanging out with and what type, you know, how strong of influence are they that you're hanging out with? You know, it's, you know, it's tough to try to explain yourself out of certain situations, isn't it? You know, especially going into places that we ought not, and we know that I would never go in here if I wasn't with these people, but then they go and we say, well, you know, they're going, I'll go, and we might not have any intention of doing anything, but Tina's right. How do you, you know, how does that look to other people? How is that going to affect what they think of me or how they see me? And how is it, you know, and, and what, I, you know, and as we go along with these things, as we list all of these, you know, how hard is it to, you know, how long does it take to build up a, a credible reputation and having a really solid influence on someone or even a group of people or an environment? It can take a lot. It takes a little while, doesn't it? Because you don't know them. You know, why would you trust them all of a sudden or why would you think they're, you know, a great influence? They could be really nice. But it does take a while before you start to think, you know, you realize, hey, you know, this person is faithful. And, you know, and, and you think, of, you know, and you work and you work and you work to try to win over certain people or try to set the precedence of what, you know, of what God expects of us. And how long does it take to destroy all that? One stupid, quick move, right? Just one statement can just make all that come crashing down. And so how, and, you know, just, you know, it really is kind of sobering when you, you know, start looking at what, at how important and why it is so important for us to maintain our influence with it. What else besides the speech or the company that we keep? Because people do look at, you know, who we're hanging out with, right? And if they're not, you know, if they're known not to be upright, or righteous, you know, it's one thing to talk to someone who we know might be outside of Christ and try to study with them and try to be a good example with them. It's another thing to just take up arms with them and do whatever they, you know, just go along with whatever they want to do. And, you know, it's, and, uh, you know I've heard this, and you probably have too, that, you know, if someone, you know, you have a child or, you know, someone in your family or a friend or whatever, and they are hanging out with people that you know are not, you know, are not great, uh, or they're not these upright people. And what do they tell you? Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be this good influence in there. Or I want to, I want to be the person that tries to change them. And you think the best, you want to think the best with them. But how many times has that other person started to rub off on them instead? Is it guaranteed every time that just because we're a Christian that we're going to rub off on someone if we start hanging out with in these kinds of environments? Bad company, corrupt. Yep. That's it, right? One lump leaving up the whole. You know, it's amazing just what. You know, just how it, it looks. Because the person isn't going, you know, you, you think of, you know, and how this looks to certain people. Now, some might say, oh, I'm so glad they're in, you know, in with these, this crowd because they're going to be a great influence for them. Or they're going to be a great example to them. And they're going to show them how to do things right and live righteously. And that's just going to be able to change them. You see that very often? What do they look at? It is. And it's, and it's far more visible, isn't it? They are going to remember the, all the people that you shouldn't have been hanging around with. And all of a sudden, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be judged. And whether you like to be judged or, you, or not, whether you think it's right or wrong, it doesn't, it, it's irrelevant because people are going to do it. They are watching. And they're watching the company that we keep. And a lot of times, this company comes with that speech, doesn't it? I mean, a lot of these will overlap. What else? What are some other things that can damage our 
influence. Okay. So manipulative and yeah. If, if your actions are contradictory to your words, then you don't you don't the influence isn't isn't as easy. As okay, I mean actions are a big part of it, aren't they? And they cover a wide range of situation. Oh, they certainly do. You know, words we can say. Well, I shouldn't have said that, and you know, just cover it up, and not say anything. But when you do something. That's going to send a huge message to other people, isn't it? Because not only are you just, you know, saying something, I can say, well, I slipped, or yeah, it was stupid to say, I'm not going to say it again. I can, but actions are, how do they know it's not going to happen again? Or what's going to, what can I do to try to, you know, you can't undo something. You can't unsay certain things, or you can't unsay anything, but you can't undo certain things either. Now you can repent of it, and you can, try to make amends for it, but you think of what our actions are capable of doing. And especially, you know, as we claim to be disciples of Christ, how is being, you know, how, how, how is that action going to reflect what we claim to be? Okay. Okay. James talks about that. Yeah. You know, you think James talks about, you know, the person, you know, how useful we are and, you know, if, if someone comes to us and they need help and they need food or the clothing and we just say, you know, and we and we are capable of helping them. Not everyone is capable. We need to be mindful of that, but if we say, you know, if we can help them and we just say, well, we'll be praying for you. Well, we well say, though, thanks, but let us know if you need help. Right. Right. It's tough sometimes when you're in a situation because does everyone, you know, when you when you say something like that, and we have a lot of, you know, we have the best of intentions, I think, when we say that. You know, when we say, okay, well, let me know if you need anything. How many times do they actually call to say, oh, hey, I need something. Can you help? Probably not very often, is it? Not very often, but when those words are in your mouth, you have to be prepared to act kind of. Okay. Okay. Don't offer something if you're not willing to so, give it, because that lets them know that, okay, within the, within the church, within the faith, and we promise to offer. Somebody's going to say they'll help me, but then when it comes time, they're not. And then when the worldly friends step in to help them, then I'm getting more from the world than I am from my from the church or from people of faith who are my friends in the world. Right. And that's yeah. going to say anything. And they are going to remember that. You know, it's tough because there's, you know, there's sort of a medium that we have to take into consideration sometimes because, you know, when we say, well, let me know if you need anything, you know, a lot of people say that and, you know, it's almost in jest because they don't, they really don't mean it or I hope they don't say anything or I don't, you know, or they just, it's just what we say or and a person doesn't do it, you know, or can we just, you know, could we just do something for them? Just, you know, look for, you know, look for the needs in a person's life and look at, you know, be mindful and 
and be very observant of what they need. If a person's going through something and say, you know what, don't wait for, I'm not going to wait for you to, you know, to ask and, and just do something, you know, about it. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes a person is like, I don't need help. No, no. But, you know, but it's amazing when you just step in and do something, how appreciative and noticeable it is to that individual. Because it, it does mean everything. If you have been proactive enough to see their problem when not a lot of people have, they're going to hear probably from just about everyone. You know, if you need help, just call me, or if you need this, or whatever it is. And, but if you do it and just. Okay. So action's a big part of it. I mean, that can, you know, doing it in a negative way. And of course, I'm glad we're taking, you know, turning this around is kind of a positive spin on this. But action really can damage our influence if we're not handling it appropriately, isn't it? What else? Okay. <laughs> Put it up there. I mean, think of what can damage our influence with people. They see you taking up something that is completely welcomed by the world. And how do you think that's going to affect us as a Christian, trying to get them into Christ? Trying to get them into the Bible, trying to get them to you know to follow suit. We're going to talk about that in a little while with this study. We're going to get into it a little bit deeper than just this. But that you know they see things. I mean you know and that has to do with our actions, does it? They see us do something, and all it takes is one time to do something, and they can and everything that we've built and everything that we've been working on and every way that we've tried to get them into Christ or interested in Christ, and all of a sudden, well, look what they're doing. They don't care. And so, you know, they see these worldly things that people do. How is that going, you know, how is that going to influence someone to, you know, for the better? It can definitely damage us with the work we try to do, isn't it? Anything else? Okay. Boy, that's definitely one, isn't it? I mean, there's an old adage that it's not just what you teach, but what? How you teach it or how you say it. We have to actually be open to constructive criticism and the possibility that I might not be right. And yeah. Right. Some are just too scholarly for their own good, right? That's uh, you know, that is a big one. You know, how how are people going to see us if you know when we try to approach them with the Bible? As I said, we have you know we we know the truth. We can follow the truth. We can believe it. We can do everything down to it. But you know what? You know how do you not do? It? Can you think of anything in Scripture or anyone in you know that we read about in the Bible who might have that kind of attitude? I can think of one, huh? Okay, the Pharisees, definitely. Well, the Pharisees, you know, the Pharisees were kind of religious elitists, and they didn't have all the right answers per se. They thought they did. And they, okay. Um, were all of them not teachable? No. 
I mean, who, you know, who was a good Pharisee that we can read about? Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. You know, we know that uh, some of them are reachable, but we know far more that they're recorded that were not because they just thought, you know, they did it. Let me read of one in particular who wanted all the preeminence. John writes about him. His name was Diotrephes, one of the preeminence in the local congregation meaning he always wanted to be right. He wanted to be it. And no one else could take his place. I mean, attitude really is everything. You think of all the, you know, you think of the ways that people were reached in the New Testament and how those people were reached and how they responded to it. I mean, even Paul, who is very scholarly, I mean, he, you know, he went to a lot of the great schools before he was converted to Christ. He came up you know, well-educated. But when he went into a city and he or went into the synagogue and it says he reasoned with them, that doesn't mean that he just went in there and said, you know what, all of you are wrong, and here's why. Now, he did call them out on occasion when he wrote to the Galatians. You know, he said, oh, foolish Galatians. But what did he do before that? How did he talk to them? He talked about the gospel. He set them up. He, you know, Paul was never one to set someone up to fail. He was never to set so, someone up to be humiliated, to feel less about their spiritual lives, because he cared about them. And when you read the, the opening salutations of all of his letters, we see that, and it's very visible of what you know, what his where his heart was with these people. He wanted them to succeed. He wanted them to he wanted them to come to Christ. He wanted them to, and so you think of that attitude. You know, just the conflicting attitudes between someone like the Pharisees or the Diotrephes or you know anyone else that we see in Scripture, compared to the apostles, some of the preachers that we read about. And you see just what their attitudes were and how they did. And the negative ones, you think of what kind of influence that will be. Push people away. So we've got attitude. Anything else? Got just, we've got a few minutes left, and there's a reason why I'm building this list. Ashley. Give me an example. I have friends that uh, there are certain subjects that I will not talk about with them at all. Okay. Okay. So we need to be careful or tread lightly sometimes with, <coughs> excuse me, with certain subjects. Um, could it be that you know there are some that just aren't ready to hear things at a particular time? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there. So knowing who you're talking to, knowing what they need to hear at, at, at a particular time, reading, being able to read people is probably a big part of it. And, you know, not all of us are probably the best readers of different, you know, different people. But you know, we do learn from that, don't we? What should I say? When should I hold back? What you know, when is a good time to bring something into a conversation that's not going to destroy what I'm trying to, where I'm trying to get them to be. All right. So we've got all these, and there's probably other ones that we can come up with as well along the way. You know, when we look at all of these, these are, you know, some of these are very relevant to looking at the fruit of the Spirit, knowing, you know, the other side of this and what is going to be effective. 
what is going to be that great influence, an example for people? What is going to help them get to heaven? Because that's ultimately where we want to go. Where we want to go. You look at Galatians chapter 15 as we look at uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And there's two conflicting things that Paul is starting to set up right here to the Galatians. And this is towards the end of the letter. But he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, a couple of things as we break this down, because this is there's a lot he's going to be saying from here on out to the end of the chapter. Uh, it says, he says, you shall not, you know, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does lust mean? What is a good definition of lust? Okay, that's a strong desire. It's not just a wanting, it's a strong wanting of it, right? What do we typically correlate lust with? Sex. But if you look at the definition of what that is in scripture, it doesn't always mean that. Now it can mean that. And a strong desire of that, and you know, some people struggle with that. But lust in and of itself is just simply a strong desire. Does it need to be always for sex? No. I mean, we talk, you know, when you look at the way covet, covetousness is in, in the Bible, it talks about the covetous, there's covetousness because there is that lust. I want something so bad. When you look at coveting something, it's saying, I want what he has or she has so bad that I'm willing to hurt them for it. And that's where it becomes really dangerous. I will take it with whatever I want, or I want it so bad that I'm willing to you know, compromise you know, who I even am. And so you have this lust of the flesh. Well, what is lust of, what's the flesh when it talks about the flesh, first off? Because once we start defining these different terms, then we start, it, we can really start gaining an understanding of what he starts to say right here. What is the, what is the flesh? Okay. It's things that in this life, isn't it? This, this is you know what we are in the flesh right here. In this life, in this world, in my own personal, you know, my, my own personal bubble going on with it. And so it, when you look at lust of the flesh, it's a strong desire of worldly things. <laughs> Or things that I want, you know, things in this life. They're carnal. We're not looking at things eternal. We're not looking at things in the spiritual sense. Lust of the flesh is a strong desire of things that many times create, you know, it's, it's an immediate wanting, isn't it? And that's what lust is. It's a desire for something. It's not a need. It's a want. Now we can, you know, we can try to rationalize it in our own mind saying, oh, I need that. I don't need a lot of things in this life. We need shelter, don't we? We need food. We need air. We need, you know, there are certain things that we just cannot live without. I want a boat. I want a truck, bigger and better than what I have now. But do I need that? So does it become a, okay? Because you might be like, in this house, a specific type of house, space unit is going to do you fine, but I might be leaning towards, I really want that more. I I really want, ah, then it does become one, so. so. But it's a need, I need the house. I need, well, I know I need a house. I need the house, but I need the house. So you can lust after a need, depending on the degree of which, you know, we, you know, we need to take care of our families. We know that that's a responsibility. And we can say, okay, I need a house that can house my, however many people I have in my family. And realistically, you know, I need this, you know, we, there's a certain amount of space that is probably needed. We know we need a roof that doesn't leak and walls that aren't falling down and stuff. But do I need a 10,000 square foot home to, you know, to deal with a family of five or four? Or... How many is in your family, Sabrina? All right, seven. seven of us, and we do not have a 10,000 know, 10, square foot estate. Uh, okay.
pushed like for all of us, especially in that high school, um, you know, not from my parents, but from other people. Mm-hmm. Your driver's license. You have no idea when I can walk it. I, everything is within walking distance. Okay. So, I mean, there are things that you need immediately. There's things that you probably, but will eventually need. But when you look at what the lust of the flesh is, a strong desire of something of the world. I mean, you think of what, you know, just how, just what a strong pull or hold that the world can really have on us. And especially as a Christian. And we know what we should be doing, right? We know the mindset that I, sh- I know the mindset I should have. I know what I should be wanting or needing or you know, how to sustain, but the world is offering us an intense desire of the flesh. I mean, you look at the wants or the lusts of the flesh. What are some of the lusts of the flesh, by the way? Okay. Oh, you're getting ahead of us. Okay. Now, you're talking about the works of the flesh, which we're going to start getting into. Probably next week we'll start hitting on, on some of those. What are, but if, when we start looking at, you know, like what is in life right now and looking at everything around us and what the world is, what are some of those strong desires of the flesh, strong desires of, you know, what is just carnal that we know are not going to last forever, but we think, wow, I want that so bad. <laughs> Money. I mean, that's a pro- probably the very top of everyone's list, right? I want money. Who doesn't need money? We need money because we have a, you know, this currency. Except right now, we have a, what, a shortage of all the coinage and stuff like that. But we need, we have a currency. It's an exchange system. And that's at the top. Who had their hand up? What is it? What did you have? I was going to say, yeah. Don't do it. Some of us really want a motorcycle. Okay. Boy, all the wives are throwing their husbands under the bus tonight, aren't they? But we sit, we look at these things, don't we? And say, wow, I really, really want that. And I'm willing to spend whatever money I have in the bank, whatever money we have for things that we really do need that are important to spend on these certain things. You know, I want this. And I have such a strong desire that I'm willing to do anything to try to get it. I mean, is it wrong to want something? Just in and of itself. No, I mean, there's, you know, we, there are things that we like, aren't there? But Sarah, I mean, when I was a kid, we had a want jar. Anytime we said, I want, we had to put a quarter in the jar. Okay. Like, that was not a... I, I hope the quarter, you know, the money at the very end wasn't to feed, like, whatever your want was. Oh, now we can pay for what no, I want. No, it was never for that. It always went okay. for the groceries or something we needed. What are some other things? I mean, I'm talking about lust. With a strong desire for this life, for this world, what are some things that people really just... Money? People like movie stars or singers want attention. Oh, attention? Okay. We crave like movies and just front the cameras all the time. Okay, so they crave, they crave the attention. Um, not everyone, I'm sure. You know, but you think when, you know, with, with all of this these lusts of the flesh, there are some, you know, is it sinful to want a motorcycle? No. Is it sinful to want money? It can be, right? That's exactly it. You know, is it, you know, when we look at it in scripture, I mean, is money the root of all evil? No. What is it? It's the desire for the money that is the root. Absolutely. Right, absolutely they do. You know, and, and here's the thing, when you look, start looking at sin, people, I mean, they don't get into sin because they hate it, do they? How do, you know, how is sin typically displayed? <laughs> That's it. Is it ever attractive? Mommy time, you need to have your time and all this stuff. And there was just no understanding that the 
moment you became a member of the body of Christ, it was no longer about you. And getting people, even within the church, to understand, wait a minute, we're redirecting the focus, and mom time should be worldly time, and fall time should be godly time. And there was just no, there was just no understanding of that, because that's what the world teaches so much, that everyone believes. If I don't have my time, we had mom say this, if I don't have my time at least once a week, I'm not, I'm not a nice person to be around, and you just want to stay away from me. Well, it, it's just the whole worldly focus. That comes back around to it, it doesn't it? A, if there's some, not some time that's set aside that's all about me, it's just, you know, unpeaceful. We're going to, um, I think that was a bell to go. We're going to, I want to look at this more next week to start, you know, to keep look and keep looking at how sin is typically displayed. Because when we start looking at the fl- lust of the flesh and how that works against, and you know, when you look at the next verse, which we'll get into as well, it says the, the, the flesh lusts against the spirit. Okay? We're going to get into what that means and just why you know, it's so important to be mindful of the lust of the flesh and you know, as we start naming these or start thinking about them and even thinking about them in our own life if we're guilty of them, and you know we're not going to call anyone out, but you know, that's not why we're here. But start looking at you know some of these things that might you know that really might start warring against the uh, you know the spirit and uh, the you know just how they they op- they operate and combat each other. You know, there is a war that is going on spiritually that involves things that are physical and tangible in this life and how we think of those. And so next week we'll get into more um, with what the Spirit is and then uh, what that means to walk in the Spirit versus that. Great. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate your help.